Definitely get yourself. You can go to the hardware store and find a handle. I, this is a hardware store handle I picked up. You, know, you can see who makes it. It's got pretty decent straight grain in it. A lot of times when you go to the hardware store, that's the biggest problem. You know, you can take this, strip off the varnish, kind of cut off that shape that you don't see very often in 18th century tools, scrape it down, and rework this into something that'll look like all of those. So there's that there's that option to do, um, but the biggest thing is looking for straight grain and tools because you know when we're when we're striking, you know we need we need that material to have continuity through that, and if that grain runs out anywhere in the handle, it's going to crack and break. Um, this billet piece right here. So when we took this tree down, this was this was infected by emerald ash borer, which is kind of cool. You can see on this side, underneath the bark layer, how emerald ash borer lays its eggs under the bark. They pupate into larva. They eat that cambi cambium layer of wood. You know that one yearly growth ring of live tissue that carries your nutrients from the root system up the trunk to the leaves. They eat that, and they consecutively make these galleries that, in effect, girdle a tree. So it ultimately dries out. It, you know, it doesn't get any water. Um, if you still have some healthy ash trees, I would suggest you want some handle material. I would suggest get them taken down before they're stone dead. This tree still had green leaves in it. Once they are totally dead, standing. The wood will have a quality called brash to it, and it's brittle. You know, look at something that had that. So if you have a chance, get yourself some ash, split it in some billets, put it in a dry place, and use it as you need to, because it will go the way of the chestnut tree. Possibly in our lifetimes, they'll come up with a hybrid that's resistant to this species, this insect. But Quite, quite honestly, I'm 44, I'm not a, and I'm an arborist. I'm not expecting to see that in my lifetime. So if you want a piece of like real true Americana forest heritage that you know the people that we represent were able to utilize every day in their lives, get some now because it's going to be gone pretty quick. But anyways, this tree when we were when we took it down, we were obviously it had a print. The trunk had very few branches in it. Lower, it had no branches lower down. Um, quite often, when you get into a tree, you know, since they grow by concentric circles, there'll be branches hidden inside there. So you know all about this stuff. <laughs> and um, you can, if you can read the bark on a tree, you can see where there'll be imperfections throughout the bark that will reveal like on this piece right here these are pinholes these are old branches from a long time ago it's going to be really really hard to see this in the bark layer to the outside so sometimes you know i mean your best bet is to get a woods tree Something that's tall, straight. If you if you take a tree down with a sweep in it, where it's grown phototropic towards the sunlight, when you rive and split it out, you're going to have that sweep in your wood. You know, when you're, it's just like splitting firewood. You know, the shape of the tree doesn't lie to you. You'll get the same thing inside it that it's shaped like. Um, so these ones are just split out. Um, 
bark was pretty clear. I've had it just, I've had clear timber described to me by some old timers as, as when you're looking at a creek or a stream and when water's flowing without any rocks near the surface, you know, you have ripples, but they're consistent. And, you know, if there's a stone in there and the water goes around it, that's kind of what growth rings do on a tree when they grow around another limb. And those knots will be imperfections in the wood that will then be imperfections in your tools. So, um, obviously this piece here, when we split it out, you know, I think we got eight billets out of one chunk of wood and you're going to have waste. Um, we started by, we cut it to length and we started by taking wedges and splitting it apart. And why don't we break that hardwood out of that piece? Has anybody ever done this? Come on, don't be shy. You rip, okay. Split out long billets for handles. So, Abraham Lincoln could make what, 500 rails a day like this? I don't, I don't know about that. Um, Ted's got, he's got an old wrought iron wedge right here. He's picking a spot where the wood has started to separate. see as he pounds that in this might this may spread split up right away ideally when you do we do this green the greener the wood is the quicker it'll come apart pull it up a second before you go too far when typically when we start this on a round piece of wood we'll take we'll take if you can say this is that imagine this is a whole log We'll, we'll look for natural cracks or checks that are in there where the wood wants to come apart. And you can take your ax and lightly score it, get a wedge started in the end, pop it in there. Typically you won't go that far. Ideally as you start to split it, if you're patient with it, you'll hear the wood coming apart. It almost, I, I like to say it's talking to you about what it wants to do. Let those cracks start gradually. And then once you get it started, we'll then put more wedges in. Mike's put that wood in one down there. And then this is a dogwood piece. And so on and so forth. This wood's been, we took this down last fall and we split it apart um, while it was green. And so everything is going to work a lot easier when it's greener. As much of the pre-work as you can do that way is ideal. But ultimately, you need to let handle material season. If you take your material and work it all the way down, fit it to the head right away while it's green, wedge it, it's going to shrink. And then all of a sudden, your, head, your handle is much too loose in there, and you, it's, not, it's junk. So that's the, first, that's the first step, get it broken down. You're just consistently breaking pieces of wood down to usable size pieces. Um, for this one, if we were going to do, if we were going to put an axe handle in this, so kind of like this head that Bill has, we could take a look. I mean, obviously, this is a hell of a long piece of wood to work with. You can shorten them up if you want. I prefer working longer because it's got, gives me something to work back from. I don't know, you know, like you can see these little bubbles on this side now. You know, I mean, that's almost like, looks like almost see old inner bark from a year's worth, from that season's worth of growth. growth. These little pinholes in here, these little pins, these are, these were the beginnings of branches. This is a woods tree. You know, at some point that, that tree had enough sunlight over there. It was like, hey, I'm going to try and grow a branch down here. Started to bud out. This is, they called those a node, actually. And it just didn't get it. The tree didn't give that enough didn't have enough sunlight, the tree was like, you're a waste of time, we're going to pass you off and put more effort up top, and it gets encapsulated in there. That is not ideal to have in your hand. Okay? You know, when you're, when you're looking at this material, we can pass some of this around. These are just, these are scraps from the, um, the uh, billet that we split out. I'll put these over there. These are scrap pieces that we rove out. This handle, Ted just worked this handle down a couple hours ago. It's going to be for that head that Greg forged this morning. 
And uh, this is shag bar kickery. We took the heartwood out and we're looking for some imperfections to pull out. Trying to get down to that really nice, clear, straight grained wood. You know, if we pass, if we pass this around, you guys can see how this is just, it's a really beautiful piece of wood. It, you know, you know how like when you got anybody buy hardwood flooring for their for their houses? Sure. You know how like the character stuff, you know, it's got knots in it and waves and flex. That stuff's junk. It's like if you wanted to do anything like this with it, you can't because those are weaknesses in it. So when I buy hardwood flooring, I wanted the straightest grain white oak because that's what the sawmill pays the most amount of money for, and that's strong, good wood. You know, those nice straight seams that we can see in there. So if we're gonna bust this out into another piece for for Greg's hand, for the head for Greg's axe, we'd probably, we could wedge this out again. There's, um, there's a couple cracks. Right here is a nice crack that started. You know, it, when you're doing this, it doesn't really pay off to fight what's in there. If, yeah, if you guys could split, if we could get into that one now, that would be awesome. That's a fine piece of ash. You know, <laughs> reading, yeah, reading the grain of the wood, it took me a, quite a while to figure it out. You know, if, it, if there's imperfections in there and you see a crack, don't work with it. Keep going. So how's that split now? Any input, Mike Galvin? I mean, I split differently. You know, I split in half. I go halves. You know what yeah. I mean? And the same idea. I just go in halves. I, I never try to take little edges off. Mm -hmm. I just don't. Yeah. And I, I think the, when you work with metal wedges, too, be careful. Wear eye protection if you can. Little splinters of uh, metal can come off as that uh, metal wedge gets folded over. You don't want to use hard. I know for hickory, you don't. You never. You don't really ever want to use the hardwood. Um, Mike actually told me about that the most stage. The outside layer that 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 sapwood and I wish I had a piece of hickory because like when you look down at it, you will have a nice white wood all the way around the outside of it, and the dark wood in the middle is not as desirable. And we we don't ever use that. Um, Kind of, I kind of sometimes I wonder if that has anything to do with like the flexibility of trees. You know, as they, as trees move in the wind and the weather, you know, those, those trunks are constantly moving back and forth, and cells are are being pulled and pushed and pulled and pushed, and the, the center wood is more stable than the outside pieces, and that healing process continually happens. And I almost wonder if, like, this, I don't know this for sure, this is my theory, but if as those cells on the outside layer of the tree are pulled apart and then regrow, it makes the wood stronger. I have black ash on that wood. What do we got there? <laughs> so this is now down to a little bit more workable size. Usually from this point, if we have a pattern, we'll we'll take one. You can you can trace a pattern out. You know, work more towards the outside edge of this, and then keep working it out. It's probably you can probably work this out now with a a fro. Yeah, we could take we could take some of this off on the inside again. Where'd the one go? That one. These are pretty bad throws, so they're, uh, that, this one's a leaf spring my buddy welded. I wish I had a nice original one. I'm in the market, so if you got something, let me know. <laughs> got two, you got three or four. Friars Antiques, Meadville, Pennsylvania. So you sure, can Antiques, Antique, Somerset, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Hold up a second, Mike. So, 
we're starting to get a nice split there. And in, in green wood, you, you'll be able to read this even easier. But you can see where this is going. And you can you can kind of work that a little bit with a fro in green wood. This stuff's so dry, it's going to go where it's going to go. Ideally, you'd have a riving break, which is the crotch of a tree, and you can set that in there to fry. So that's that's pretty. Yeah, this is pretty pretty enlightening. You know, you, we just split that apart, and it's probably somebody with a really good eye would have saw this this bubble that was on that inside edge there. What what's that from? A Million dollar question. Branch. Branch. Yeah, look at that right there. Mm. So, you know, we got right there, we got, that's not going to be ideal. Mm. You know, that pinhole down here, you can see where that tree was growing over. That was probably a little stick at some point. You know, yeah. all the way down. This side's nice and clear, but that part isn't. Yeah. And now you get down into a billet, and you can keep doing the riving process to what you need. Or you can get into using a, you can trace a shape, work it with a small hatchet. You could even get down in, if you really wanted to, you could work that bunch of material from the uh, shaving horse. That takes more out of that. Okay. So this piece probably isn't a total waste. I mean, you got, yeah, this side is still, you have some pretty decent wood in there. You could shorten it up for smaller tool handles. A lot of times when we're, I like working with longer stuff. Like I said, you, you waste, you, you may find a piece that's short enough to work to get something good out of that. The same process that the way shingles are made. And you can see where that wood grain is just running out on the side there. Is that another knot? Yeah, right here. Okay. Just running out on it. So probably, you know, this this would be this probably this would be decent enough. I would probably start taking this stuff off. Yeah, you could use short handles. I don't think you're going to get enough length for an axe handle out of that, you know. I wouldn't want that not right in there. And I brought I brought some some pieces that failed over the years for different reasons. One of them, this axe head, this is a piece of red or white oak, we're not sure. My friend made it out of a um, floor joist that was from a, a stone and log house in Kentucky. So the cool thing is, is this piece of wood is like 500 years old, you know, and he's like, I'll make you an axe handle out of it. It was great. Obviously, it got abused. It was used for splitting, and the shoulder got beat up. But ultimately, you know, you can see in there, there was a knot somewhere up in here in the tree that caused that tree to grow with that curve on it. And, it, you know, it lends itself to the strength of wood, you know, where that grain is up in the head, and it continues up through this side. I mean... This has been like this for four years, okay, and I, I use it a lot still, but ideally that split just keeps running down and following the wood. So if you can avoid that imperfection, your tool handle is going to be a lot stronger. You can pass that one around. Um, <coughs> we talked about brash wood. Um, this axe head, I took down this awesome pig nut hickory tree. And um, it was super straight grain, 110 foot woods tree. When we, it was hung up in another tree and we had to get it down for a client. And when I undercut it, the whole thing just split. And the bottom dropped out and there's this 12 foot long piece of perfectly clear wood. I was like, awesome, ax handles, I'm halfway there, you know? So I took it home and it sat outside for a year and a half before I did this process. And then I took it to my buddy's house and we rived it out and we made axe handles and we headed up like four axes like this. And they all broke. Every single one of them broke straight across. That's one head. 
We're chopping with them. It's awesome. We're kicking butt, building a long, little log cabin, and they and they I broke this one myself. Hit a log, and that whole thing just severed right off. So basically, what happens when wood's brash? You know, wood is a very straws right on top of each other. It sat too long. It was exposed to moisture. Fungus got inside the cells of that tree and it started to rot and deteriorate the wood to the point where it appeared hard and stable, but it was actually weak. So if you have questionable material that's been sitting for time that you're not sure of, you might not want to waste your time making a uh, putting all that time into axe handles or tools out of it. It'll just get the tune. Um, so if we want to get into do, going farther then with an axe handle from there, um, we won't do it with this stuff because it's pretty time consuming, but you would take, Ted or Mike are working on a hatchet handle now, has they, are you folks familiar with the shaving horse or schnitzel bone? Schnitzel bone. Yeah, hands, oh, all right, good, yeah. This is, this is like the godsend to creating handles. You know, because you can use the ultimate tool to draw a knife there. Um, I always try to think about like, you know, the long hunter scenario, the trapper, the guys out on campaign. What what do you do if you break your hatchet handle? You know, I mean, in essence, if you have a piece of wood, you could use you could use a club and your old ha hatchet head or tomahawk head to, to get to this point. You could take and scrape, shape, split with a building of firewood, all that pounding. But ultimately, the best tool to use is the shaving tool. It looked like a scene. You know, from this from this point, it's just a reduction game. You know, there's no no real secrets to it other than. Got your, you got your material, you can kind of, you can kind of lay out what you want to do with the head. Um, this one, actually this handle is going to be for a pretty nice half axe that Randy Wolf forged back in the 90s. Let me see that one second. Uh, so here's the, here's the head that we're going to put on there. You know, we did that reduction process till we got this billet, shaped it down to that trying to figure out what the straightest point's going to be. You know, I always like to take the piece, put it on the wood, and kind of draw it out with a pencil, mark what I'm going to do with it, and then you just start reducing it down the way Ted is. Um, this handle that he, that's going to be for Greg's, Greg's axe, you know, you can see how it's, uh, where he's going to fit that in, you know, reducing that down to the eye. Um, just shaping it out for what you want. There's a bunch of every every tool that you can get expedites the process. You know, there's different shaving draw knives. We got some different size pieces. These most of these are all antique tools. Probably 1900 stuff. I don't think any of it's specifically 18th century. Um, I think, I believe this is a cooper shave? Yes. Is that right? Yeah, for doing barrel staves? Inside, yeah. Yeah. So Holloway knife. Yeah. Um, it works good for axe handles, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pretty, pretty <laughs> cool, you know. And then uh, after this process, it just comes on down to, you can use scrapers. That's what all of these are. Just different size scraping tools for fine work. Can get into sandpaper ultimately, and um, just reduce down. I don't, I don't think we're going to get into the uh, have time to get a, a tool. I mean, if you hang out long enough, we may get into doing wedging something. Um, any questions at this point? Yeah. <coughs> what did he most, What did he most commonly use to get a smooth finish on the wood in the 18th century? Well, the, these tools, these scrapers are, you know, will reduce it down to pretty, pretty fine, pretty smooth material. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure, like, 
I don't think sand. When do they start using sandpaper, Mike? I don't think they. It's just tool finished, as far as I know. So even on furniture and stuff like that, yeah. it's tool finished. Yeah. He's working on some stuff. I was just like, you know, what do they used to, to use? Yeah. I mean, both of both of the. I handled both of these, and that that's that's ash, and that's just scraped. I didn't sand. They had some stuff that was uh, used that's, glass, and it was known to be pretty hazardous to folks out, so they just didn't use it that much. Some ways are going to be double the flat dogs, which, which is the best way to attach to the I use it both. Yeah, sometimes it's like if you if you use that flat edge, you can cut. If you flip it, you can use like a wedge and split. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know what the right or wrong way is. But, um, well, the one, if you got a chi like a chisel, if you're you're drawn up to sharpen like a chisel, right? So it's only sharpened on one side. Um, if you hold it so that that chisel bevel is going, you know, it's on the top of your tool, you can cut in deeper and take heavier cuts. If you flip it around and you're cutting, you can. It's a little bit more fine. You have more control. You're not you're not really trying to do that real reduction quickly. You know. You can see how nice, it, how fine the shavings are that the scrapers take off. I mean, you can you can use a scrap piece of steel, glass. I mean, pretty much anything. It's just a, re, it's all a reduction process. Taking that big chunk of wood and reducing it down into little pieces that you work consecutively smaller. Um, you know, once you get your handle shaped out, you got you'll have to get in get into fitting the handle to the eye of your tool and um you know that's 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 probably for me the most tedious part of the process because you know the more the more space that's in the eye of your tool the easier it is for it to loosen up so having a really nice having that wood where you can slide that the head into there and it and it fills it up a good bit is ideal both in the in the ends of the tool and the sides, and then you're going to need to um, put a wedge in. I don't think I brought. Okay, how many people have put handles in tools? Who wedges towards the blade? Anyone? Who wedges to the side? Anyone? I want to. What's the advantage? I don't. I don't know. I. I've done this one. I put two in because I. This is the second handle I put in this. I was sick of it. Loosen it up. I was like, damn it. I cut it. I put a wedge in this way, and then I put another one that way. Yeah, I so, put it across. So far, so yeah, good. I did both. Put a wood wedge in and put a steel one across. Yeah, yeah, or the old. A lot of the old tools I've seen. One wedge. Yeah. Most of the time. Uh, just what I can say about it is the taper, the eye yeah. usually yeah. goes yeah. like this, yeah. or sometimes it's more of a okay. hourglass. And if you after the auction put a wedge yeah. with that taper, then it's going to lock in a little bit better in my mind. Mm -hmm. But you know, I've only made three or four handles with them. <laughs> so the whole goal of a wedge <laughs> is, is to get that wood expanded inside that eye, right? So if you can get, if you have, if you have any space in there, if your wedge spreads it apart across the top of the eye, that's going to be secure. I heard something pretty interesting for the very first time two weekends ago. Somebody, we were talking about wedge and tools, and uh, a, a guy that does some smith work was looking at something. And he's like, oh yeah, that guy, he knows what's up. He wedged it where the grain is. And I was like. That, I was like, that makes sense, because if, like on this piece of wood, the wood grain, if you look really close at it, so like if this were positioned in the tree, looking down at like the whole cutout log, the grain's running this way on it. So according to our friend Tom, he was saying that you would cut, ladder, cut across here and wedge it out to keep that grain together. And in theory, that would keep the wood from splitting out down into here. I don't know. Or is there a preference which way you want that grain to run in relation to your your blade? 
That's something else that I'm not too sure of. Like, I've heard that, you know, some tools you want to you wanna face them towards the outside of the tree. I've never specifically made a handle in that relation. I've always made my handles where I got the straightest grain and where it would be the strongest for the force coming down. Mike, do you have any insight on that? Uh, not, not, but not too much. I mean, you know, I, I guess what I'd do is put the, I'd put the, like it was an axe handle, I'm trying to think of how, how I've always done it, is I have the, the blade pointing towards the center of the tree. Towards you understand the what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I haven't handled enough stuff and broke enough of them with that <laughs> thought process to know what's better. Sick, I don't know. So do a couple and let me know next year. <laughs> so, but anyways, you know, you're going to, you know, I just, we take a handsaw, cut down in there. Um, usually like a, a handle this size, I, I cut down an inch, inch and a half at the most. Stick that in there, and I always try to bury, get as much wood sticking out as possible as I can, and then drive my wedge in there and expand it out. And then if you, you know, the more, the more wood you have sticking out the top, if your handle does shrink, you got something to play with. You know, I usually try to leave mine sticking out more because if there's something up there to work, you have something to work with. If you cut it off too short, it's just gone. So, like this saw. Uh, this this big axe over here, like you can see how the how the eye has is pretty a lot of dirt in there. It's pretty buried. That other one, handle you can see how it Yeah, this one's really start started to dry out, and um, so that that's something else to think about too. You know. Wood, wood is never perfectly stable, you know. It, it's always in movement, you know, as moisture, heat, and cold are available, you know, when, when it's cold, you know, what's going to happen to wood fibers? Well, they're going to contract. When it's hot, they expand. It's like water, you know. So you have, even though that, that old tree's dead, it's still alive, kind of. It's still moving. And this, this so like, if you're, that's the biggest thing to think about with tools with wooden handles. How, where, when you work them, you want wood that's dried in season, so that it, that that expansion and contraction of fibers is going to be reduced the most. And then from there, as you care for your tool and where you use it and what you do with it. What happens to it from there? You know, like an environment, outdoor environment like this is pretty damp, you know, but we don't have temperature extremes. You know, it's like you take, this ax has been in my garage now for like a year, right by my wood stove. So what's gonna happen to that wood? Yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna shrink and contract, of course. If it wasn't next to that heat source, it'd, probably, it'd be a lot more stable. It would have, you know, it would be, have that humidity, that would work into it. And that's another thing too with, with tools, once you get them handled up, wood pieces, it once when they're nice and dry in a seasoned piece like what this material is, you know, once you get it handled up, I like to give it a few weeks in, um, you know, cool, no temperature extreme environment, see if that wood's gonna shrink up, if I gotta make some adjustments, and then ideally you seal them up, you know, Try and keep that moisture out of them. It'll keep that wood more stable, and you go from there. I like painting tools because I like colors. That that short handled um, hammer pole that has linseed oil on it. That carpenter's ad hatchet has linseed oil with some um, iron oxide pigment in it. Um, you know, pretty you could do pretty much anything in them to. Uh, um, seal up those, those that wood so that moisture can't get back into there because it wants to suck it up. It want, those cell fibers are always open on the ends and anywhere it's been cut, it can absorb that again. Um, I think 
I brought I brought one tool that my friend put a, a really nice handle in this. I just I love I wanted to bring this because you can really see this is ash also. You can really see the grain in this tool. We used a, a poplar wedge on it. It's moved around a little bit. It's just he did a really nice job tapering it down. This is awesome. It looks cool, but I've never seen that on any historic shit. So I don't know. Don't you know? I wouldn't do it to my tools. He's he's just does blacksmith work, and he wanted to decorate it. But um, this hat typically your wedge needs to be a softer wood than what you're using for your handle. Anybody heard or done different than that? Well, we've got to ask that question. What the preference of wedge material would be? I use poplar because we have a lot of it. You, know, you say you want that softer than your handle wood. Right. And I, I thought I it would believe, be the opposite. What's that? I always, always kind of thought it would be the opposite. You wanted a, a hard wood for your wedge to, so it doesn't compress and drives the, the handle apart. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Yeah, I, I, I don't I'm either. Not. I mean, I've had good luck with softer stuff. I guess in theory, if you used a harder wedge than what your handle is, you could crush the fibers on your handle, the wood fibers. I don't, I don't know. You know, that's that's kind of what I was taught. You know, does it work? I lose all my shit. You know, I've handled a lot of this stuff. <laughs> of course, if you're using hickory, it's pretty hard to get something that's a harder wood than hickory. So. Yeah, yeah. So. I don't know, that's kind of like, that's kind of gist of it. This isn't a huge thing. I mean, we could get into making handles together. I just thought we'd bring some material out and share it with you guys. And if you got, if you want to come handling, check any of this stuff out, any questions. I watched your forges this morning. I want to see it. It's good. That's going to, that's going to go up for auction, I believe. Um, it's on the raffle ticket. I yeah, it's a raffle item. Okay. I think I think Greg wants to finish that himself because he wants to file that out. But this will be the handle for it. He just took nothing. Made it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, for splitting wood, do you find it easier to split the bottom part of the tree up or from the tree down? Does it make a difference, or you know, that that's an interesting question, and um, it depends. I mean, straight grain wood just blows apart anyways, but when when I'm splitting wood, typically I'll look for like if there's a branch union or a knot in there. Typically splitting from the bottom of the tree towards that, because trees grow up, right? So if you're, if you're splitting in the bottom section, it's easier to peel a layer off, off that piece rather than to fight it coming into it. You because know, the wood fibers in a branch union, you know, if, if an ideal one that's that's 90 degrees, those fibers, as the tree grows, they go over, right? So you can peel pieces off the side, but it's harder to peel them off the top and over. Like, I mean, that's, sometimes it, I, that's not the, that's not true for every birch bark. Uh, one thing I was going to say is um, when your hand when you're fitting your head onto it, trying to get my what I do is uh, it, I don't fit it right away. I take it inside when it's almost there, you know what I mean? It's almost going to slip on my head and set it next to the wood stove for a day or two and let it, let it overdrive. Then rasp it or however you want to fit the head, put it on, and then when it gets back into ambient humidity, it, it's fixed. Back up <clears throat> yeah, that's trying to get it to the lowest lowest size it's going to be, right? Yeah. 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 So I don't know. That's kind of what we got. You know, you guys get out yeah. there and get some ash trees, and make some handles, and have a little bit of piece of history.